please welcome I-24 News Correspondent, Dan Revive. I'm sure that all of you know that the election in Israel is just over two weeks away, right? The election date is April 9th. And over the course of this conference, we'll hear from leaders from across the Israeli political spectrum, left, center, and right. Our next guest is one of the top Israeli political leaders vying for a seat in the Knesset, frankly, almost sure to get one again. Stav Shafir has served in the Knesset since 2013. At the time of her election, she was the youngest ever member of the Israeli parliament, and Stav Shafir has reminded me that she still is. She's a member of the Labor Party. Stav has established herself as one of the nation's leading progressive advocates for social justice. You might know the phrase, Tzedek Chevrati. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome member of Knesset, Stav Shafir. so much for finding the time to come here because frankly an APAC audience wants to know not just what's going on in Israel now but especially from leaders like yourself what the future is uh, j just so you know who's questioning you right I'm, I'm the son of two Israelis but I grew up here in America I feel the America Israel connection and I know that people are concerned about that uh, could you describe to us as you look to the future and I do say you'll still be a member of Knesset. You are high on the Labor Party list. You did great in the party primaries. What's your view of where Israel's going and, and what are the biggest challenges? Thank you, Dan, and, and thank you all for being here and thank you for inviting me to this very important conference with very important audience and, and activists who are helping Israel a lot all the time for many, many years, so I'm, I'm really honored to be here. My vision for Israel is based on the principles of the Declaration of Independence and of the national anthem, the hope, Atikva, to be a free, free people in our own land. And this means that in Israel, every person should deserve of equal rights and of equal opportunities, uh, whether if, if they are um, secular, religious, or ultra-Orthodox, if they're Jews or Arabs, and they have to feel full freedom and full um, possibilities and hope uh, to be safe, to be secure, to accomplish their dreams, to be able to take care of their families. And for that to happen, Israel should start following its interest. Following its, it's interest. It's been a long time that our country is stuck. Instead of following, following our interest, our security interests, our social interests, it's stuck under um, a politics of stagnation. The first and most important interest that we have to accomplish is a two-state solution. And that's for, <laughs> for Israel to be Jewish and democratic, which means with a majority uh, of Jews, we have to separate from the Palestinians, from 2.8 million Palestinians who live in the West Bank, and to keep the Jewish majority in Israel. This can only be possible with a two-state solution. This opens for us huge opportunities in the Middle East as well. Uh, it's been over a decade that the Arab Initiative has been on the table offering Israel normalization with the um, uh, moderate Arab countries in the region. This opens opportunities to create stronger connections uh, with our neighboring uh, countries with whom we already have a long-standing peace agreements like Jordan and Egypt. Of course, to answer the, another wonderful opportunity with the European Union for um, a semi-membership of the EU, which started in an offer that was given in 2013. Loads of opportunities in the region that we should go and take forward. First and outmost, because we don't want to be stuck in this conflict forever. And because we want to keep Israel as Jewish and democratic, and because we want to um, not waste all of our military forces, all of our security forces, in dealing with the conflict with the Palestinians and start turning and looking uh, at greater 
uh, threat that we have on our security today. Uh, the one and most important one is the Iranian threat that's been expanding in the region, uh, and we should focus and, 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 and we should better focus on that than continuing with this uh, way uh, too long and painful conflict. And so, Stav, what, what's the American role in that? Everybody knows that probably soon, who knows, after the Israeli election, there'll be a peace proposal from the Trump White House. Uh, and beyond that, of course, we have here Americans who care deeply about Israel. So in, uh, you were speaking about the Palestinian-Israeli issue. What's the American element in that? Yeah, I'll answer to that, but before I have to tell you something about why the vision that I was talking about is now at risk. At risk. Now, I just came, I came from Israel yesterday. For the past months, I had to walk in my own country, in my own city in Tel Aviv, accompanied with security guards. Because a few weeks ago, I appealed to court against the followers of Kahana, the most extremist, racist, anti-democratic forces that are now trying to enter parliament, to enter government. Uh, they are threatening our very democracy. And the biggest threat today that my vision and the vision of, of the, the, the majority of Israel is hold, uh, the biggest threat on this vision is what's happening today to the Israeli democracy. We are in the middle of election, but this is not about the election. This is about a government that's giving, that's re-giving legitimacy to the extremist forces. If to just give you the equivalent, one of these people that I appealed against has a picture in his living room of Baruch Goldstein, that's like, just imagine a congressman here in America with a picture on his wall in his living room of the um, Pittsburgh synagogue terrorist. That's the equivalent. And these people are trying to enter our parliament. They're trying to um, hurt our democracy from within, and they're supported by the government. So when I appealed against them, I started to get threats on my life. And I'm not the only person mm -hmm. recently Many people who opposed what's happening, who were critical against the government or against what it was doing and tried to um, express their criticism, started to feel threatened. Mm -hmm. and, I, I, and I hate to cut you off, and I, 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 you'll hear from Stav more, by the way, uh, at the conference, but can you help us with the American part, including in what you consider protecting freedom of speech, democracy, and one other issue? the threat of BDS, yes, a worldwide uh, movement to boycott Israel. What's the American side and what could these supporters possibly do? America has a huge role. And our friends and allies here has an, have an enormous role. And we saw that a couple of weeks ago when, when APAC gave that such an important statement against this bunch of racists. And I, I personally felt so supported by your statement, and that's exactly the manifestation of the connection that must be with us, because the connection is between people. It's not only between politicians. It's between the people well, when there in are Israel and in America. When there are critics of Israel, even a few in Congress now, and around the world and on campuses, people who would want to boycott Israel, some folks may think, let's not talk to them. Let's just label them as enemies. People who do that, people who participate in the BDS, they're not contributing anything to a two-state solution. And this must be, must be said. And it's very unprogressive to support the BDS because boycott is not helping us to solve the conflict. It's the very opposite of that. At the core of the BDS, there are anti-Semitic organizations who don't agree with Israel's right to exist. They're not our partners. Is there a middle and group, a middle group that maybe we should engage with? No, but I think we, we have to talk to everybody. And you know, APAC and Israel always knew how to be very strategic about that. Israel is a really progressive country. And, the, and most of Israelis, and this is something that you have to know, they're not always agree with their government. 70% of Israelis, which is like I think in every country, right? 70 <laughs> 70% of Israelis want a two-state solution. 90% of Israelis are willing to pay money from their own pocket in order to help the health care of a person they don't know. 90%.
Over 75% want civil marriage, gay marriage. Most of Israelis support the right of every Jew to experience their Judaism in Israel however they want, including women praying in the Kotel. That's the majority of Israelis. And the connection between us has to be bipartisan, and it has to be a connection between the people. Governments change. Sometimes it happens. But the people, the connection between our nations, is the long-standing connection that will serve both our mutual values that we have in Israel and in America, and our political and security interests, and that must be maintained and protected all the time. And we do this through conversation. We're not afraid of criticism. Our democracy is strong enough to handle this crisis. We're not afraid of criticism, and we're not afraid of telling our friends sometimes, maybe we can think of another way. We are friends, and we are part of one family. And Israel is the only country in the world, the only Jewish country in the world, the only place where Jews can feel completely free and completely at home, must serve its cause, its greater cause, as protecting and defending Jews from anti-Semitism all around the globe. And actually, it's more than that. It's more than that. It's protecting human beings everywhere from experiencing some of the things that we experienced in the past. We have this enormous role and really heavy burden on our, on our shoulders. But I know my people in Israel, and I know the Israeli democracy, and I know the people here in this um, important audience, and I know that together we can overcome these obstacles and recreate the strong connection that has always been between our countries. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, at age 33, one of the top leaders of Israel's Labor Party, Stav Shafir. Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you so much.